This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. James chapter 1 this morning in your Bibles. We'll get back into the book of James here. James chapter 1. To bring you back up to speed with what we've covered so far, we've uh, looked at the book of James. We've introduced James as the author. We've gone through, uh, James talks about wisdom. And this, uh, this verse here, it's, it's hard to say which section this verse goes with. And I'll show you what I mean by that real quick, quickly here. James chapter 1. Before we even read the verse, we'll be at verse 12 this morning. James starts this little section after he introduces himself in verse 1. He says, My brother, in verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And he talks a little bit about temptations. He then closes out this little thought or this little section with verse 12. He says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. However, verse 12 is very strongly connected also with Verses 13 to 18. So it's it's as if verse 12 may be a, a closing up of this little section where he's talking about temptations um, and our temptation to look to other things other than the Lord. And then it also goes into the question of where does temptation come to, from. Today we're just going to focus our attention here on verse 12. And so James chapter 1, verse 12, there we read, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let's pray, and we'll jump right in here this morning. Lord, we thank you for this text of scripture and for the promise it contains. Lord, I ask that you just give me clarity of mind as I preach. Would you allow what you desire to be presented here, uh, the truth that you want to come across. And Lord, would you open our hearts to truth here this morning? Lord, would you clear out the distractions, allow us to uh, put away all the the troubles of the week and the problems that are are going on in our lives. And Lord, just focus for a little bit on your word. And Lord, we're expecting your spirit to minister and teach each of us here this morning. Lord, we're asking for you to meet with us in this time in your son's name. Amen. Amen. The title of today's sermon um, is The Testing of Your Faith. Now, I need to give credit where credit's due. Um, as I prepared and I did the work and dicing up the verse and word studies and that type of stuff, um, I, I hit, reached that point where I was trying to put this together into a sermon, not just an academic presentation, if that makes sense. And um, I have to give credit to... Uh, Charles Spurgeon, because he had an unpublished, and I don't know, it might have been an unpreached sermon on this verse that I just took his outline. I moved it around a little, but I used his outline. Um, it was just very well done, very simple, and it was a preacher's outline it could preach. So uh, to give credit where credit's due, I'm borrowing his outline for this verse here this morning. Um, and if you want to read his sermon Let me know. I'll print it off for you. Um, He probably said things better than I do. But just right off at the beginning here, um, he talks about the condition of this man is blessed. Here we have uh, verse 12 here. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. This man is blessed. This blessing means happy, And some translations have put it as happy, but happy is not deep enough. Um, It's a word that carries a little bit of a religious and theological significance behind it. And if you remember the Beatitudes, where it's kind of a style of teaching that Christ used in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, 
He used this over and over. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And on and on the Beatitudes goes. It's a style of teaching and reminding us that the statement that's going to be true is how you enjoy a blessed life. But it's not simply happy because it connects to the idea of being close to God. Uh, usually, as this word gets translated, it's if you look at the circle there, the blue represents how many times it's translated as blessed, whereas the others are happy. It usually carries that more significant or deeper tra- uh, sense of a theological meaning of not just happy, but of a nearness to God and his way of living. Um, again, uh, one author put, One who has experienced God's approval is blessed. One who just has a positive approach to life is one who is happy. Uh, Again, I borrowed from uh, uh, Spurgeon's sermon, and he said, If you're a child of God, your troubles will make you go oftener to your father. The more you are troubled, the more you are brought near to God. No one knows all the depths of the meaning of this word, Blessed. It is such a great word. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And notice here, it's blessed is the man that endureth temptation. And that's what Spurgeon is hitting on. When we go through trials and temptations in life and we run to the Lord, we experience his blessing. You, you could almost say his touch upon your life, his involvement, his interaction with your life and mine. But not just is this man blessed, but the character of this man, he's a man that endures temptation. Now, temptation here is not the blessing itself. Um, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. He's, going, he's blessed because he endured. Um, the endurance is what produced the blessedness. Spurgeon again said, and he's not the only one I'll quote today, all right? But he had a lot of great quotes dealing with this text. It is not blessed are they who suffer, but blessed are they who endure temptation. Lest we care to distinguish between temptation and enduring temptation, it is not blessed is the man who escapes temptation. He went on to say later, he said, it is not temptation that brings the blessing it is the enduring of it enduring is looking up and saying my god has sent these trials and by his grace i will take them and bear them all for him you know it's the devil who says to you and i in the middle of temptation or chesting he said you're so troubled your life is such a mess everything's going so wrong because god has forsaken you And yet the very opposite is true, is that sometimes the troubles and trials in our life is God trying to draw us to himself. He lets those things happen so we run to him and we turn to him and we go back to him. And God uses these trials in our life to produce believers. God wishes to use trials to produce believers who stand their ground through a devout shaped or devout life shaped by the word of God. God wants your life and mine to be shaped by his word, to conform to his word, and as we endure tempting and tests, we will be blessed. Because we'll find that our life is is hitting in vain or it's in in, in groove or in sync with how God has meant for our life to be. The Endurance here produces blessedness, but I want you to also notice the word temptation. Trials are not temptation. This is the same word used previously in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into uh, various trials and temptations. Um, Temptations and trials aren't the same. I like the way it's put here. The trials of life are to be endured not temptations. Temptations are to be resisted. 
Paul said in Corinthians, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Temptations come from within. It's a temptation to sin and to do what's wrong. It can come from Satan himself. But a test can come from God. That's why James can say in verse 13, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. The same Greek word can go both ways, and yet it must be distinguished. Here's kind of how it works, and I tried to visualize it to help so we can understand it. As believers, as a child of God, we're, we have pressures placed upon us. Let me use some history or historical figures from Scripture. Abraham and Sarah. God said, you're going to have a son. They couldn't have a son. That's an expectation or a pressure. God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. The Egyptians were chasing the Israelites, and they're at the Red Sea with the Red Sea at one side and the Egyptians at the other, and they needed deliverance. There was no food and water in the desert. And how would they respond to that need as they wandered for 40 years in the desert? When Joshua went to enter the land, there were giants in the land that needed to be conquered. When Assyria is at Jerusalem's doorstep and standing there mocking them and and saying vulgar things to them under King Hezekiah and saying no other God has delivered their people from the Assyrians. Your God won't either. That's such an interesting passage because it even says that your God won't deliver you because you threw down all his idols. When you read the passage in text, Isaiah threw out all the idols of the false gods. But Israel had been so entrenched in false idolatry for so long that the Assyrians thought they threw out the God of Israel. They didn't even know who the real God of Israel was. And lastly here, when Esther is under a decree that all the Jews are going to be killed, how is she going to respond to this? Now these are some cases in Scripture, but you can plug in your own problems, whether it's financial or social or physical or whatever it be. There are pressures that test us. And the question is not the pressures, it's how do we respond to those pressures? How do we respond when it just looks like it's impossible? God's not looking to make sure your life or mine goes perfectly as we plan. He's looking for us to have a perfect heart that trusts Him. We were with our kids um, Saturday um, or yesterday morning, and I was letting them watch a, a little Bible series, and they had this little song in there that was kind of funny, but it was, Hallelujah, see what God can do. You see, in the middle of Abraham and Sarah unable to have a child, they know that I can't do it, but look what God did. In the middle of sacrificing Isaac, although the sacrifice never took place, Hebrews tell us that Abraham said, if I sacrifice my son and if I kill him, I know that God is able to raise him up from the dead. And God provided a way out. Egyptians, Red Sea, the children of Israel standing there in peril in a test, they could have inwardly responded and said, Woe is me, let's uh, throw up our hands and the, and the white flag and surrender to the Egyptians. But Moses said, no, we're going to go across the Red Sea because God's going to provide. And guess what? Hallelujah, look what God can do. He parted the Red Sea for all of them to cross. No food and water in the desert? Well, they didn't always respond right to that one, that's for sure. But God provided And the funny thing is, after God provided once or twice, you would kind of think by the second time they needed water, instead of complaining, they would have said, hey Moses, could you go hit another rock for us? Or could you talk to God about this water issue? You know, you would have thought. But you know, we could get our our backs down on them, but how many times in our own lives do we see God work and then next week we don't trust Him for the next thing? Or with us, the giants in the land exercising faith to defeat them, or Assyria um, at the doorstep, or under Esther, the decree to kill the Jews. How God, how are you going to fix this? You read the book of Esther, it's like 
it's like a satire. It, it's everything's backwards. It's so funny because the guy who's in power and with money and wealth is the guy who's trying to plan the death of Mordecai and he ends up being killed by the same gallows he built for Mordecai. And although God's name is technically not mentioned ever in the book, you see the hand of God through the whole thing. Your response and my response to the trials of life, we can either respond favorably and trust the Lord, or we can respond with doubt. Again, this is what James has already hit in James chapter 1, verse 8. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Who are you going to trust? Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to trust the Lord and listen to His voice and what He said, or are you going to trust your observations and what you see? These trials may be different for each of us, and that's part of life. Warren Rearsby said, if we're not careful, the testings on the outside may become temptations on the inside. When our circumstances are difficult, we may find ourselves complaining against God, questioning His love, and resisting His will. At this point, Satan provides us with an opportunity to escape the difficulty. This opportunity is a temptation. Uh, We are to flee from temptations. We're not to hang around, but the thoughts that can come within us, they're sin because they're tempting us to doubt God. And these can be different for each of us. According to James, the poor endure the troubles of their poverty. The rich endure endure the temptation to trust their wealth rather than in God alone, and therefore to be double-minded. Those between the two extremes are tempted by their desires and rationalizations to imitate the wealthy. These lifelong tests are revealed at the end of life with the reward of divine life. In the meantime... Each is to pursue or is to pursue genuine love for God that issues in the true religion. And James gets into what true religion is. But here, tests and temptations, or trials, excuse me, and temptations are not the same. I want to bring up here as well, this word tried is a silversmithing term or a metal term. And I've mentioned this before, but silver is an interesting one because the silversmith knows when the metal is pure by when he can see his reflection in it. God is putting you and me through trials in this life. He's not tempting us with evil. But he's putting us like Abraham and Sarah, where, yeah, you're 100 years old, or you're 75 when he makes the promise. Yeah, you're going to have a kid here. Yeah, right, that's not possible. He's putting us in tests How we respond can turn to sin if we choose to doubt God, but God is wanting to create in us his own image. We are being conformed into the image of Christ, and as we're tempted, if we come forth refined and pure, we'll reflect the image of our Maker. When God looks into our lives, he'll see himself, he'll see his Son, Jesus Christ, in us. And metal reflects that. Silver will reflect that um, once it's it's been refined. God, unlike our school system also, hit the button twice. God, unlike our school system, will not graduate us until we pass the test. He's not ready to put us as metal to be used if we haven't passed the test and the dross has been removed. Also here, we have the perspective before this man. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. What is the prospect? What is he looking for? What is the goal? God has promised here the crown of life to those that trust him. This crown of life is for those, or is for, it's a future crown. This has been called um, by some, and if you find it in a lot of books, it's called, in our terms, the martyr's crown. Those who are willing to lay their life down for the Lord. It also comes up in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, but it's a future reward. It's eternity with God. Men are not merely made perfect by trials, 
but are to be more than compensated for losses. A crown of life is the promised reward. Now this crown is also not just future, but I think it represents or points to the present fullness of life. I may get ahead of myself here. Who lives for eternity? We all do. So this crown of life cannot simply be the fact you get to live for eternity. This crown of life, and I I think it's tied into the martyr's crown, but I think it's referring to even the fullness of life, of a life hid with Christ in God. There is survival and there is living. And this is promised those who endure the temptations when they're tried, they're going to receive the fullness of life. Spurgeon said the crown of life means life in all the enjoyments of life, life in all its glories, the very cream of life. We can experience eternal life now, James says, and the person who has preserved and passed the test can receive the crown which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I think it's it's kind of like this. When Christ came to earth, he said, my kingdom, my father's kingdom, it's come. It's here now. Is it here in its full bloom and full glory? No, because we read in scripture that one day Christ is going to come to earth and rule and reign physically here on earth and establish his kingdom here. And the millennial kingdom will usher into and and transition into eternity, into heaven. I think that's kind of what's here with this crown, is that there's a measure of this crown. You can experience a fullness of life now. In the middle of temptations, in the middle of trials and testings, when you have the perspective of, I love the Lord and I'm trusting the Lord, I don't know how all this is working out, I don't know what's going to go on, but I know He has a plan, I know He's working on me, I know He's making me what I ought to be, I know He's doing the right thing. That'll produce within you a sense of joy and happiness and peace in the middle of cancer, in the middle of a loved one dying, in the middle of a tragedy or a car accident, or it doesn't matter what happens in life with the perspective that God is in control and I can trust Him, I can endure whatever this is because I have a big God who has big plans for my life. I can trust Him, and when we trust Him, you know what happens? We take our hands off the controls. I had the privilege a couple years ago to go to um, a, a prayer conference in Virginia or West Virginia. I can't remember. And I was not orchestrating the trip. I was invited to go on the trip. They paid for my airfare and everything else. All I needed to do, to do was arrange and go. So I went. They had my plane tickets. I didn't worry about it. Now, I know most of us probably would worry, but... I didn't worry about it. They had the vehicle to get us to the airport. Hey, if we ended up late, I didn't worry about it. They paid for it all. When we got to the conference and all this and that, I didn't even know what state I was in half the time. I just sat back, read a book, and I enjoyed myself. Why? Because I was willing to completely rest in the people who had decided to take me along. That, hey, you planned this out. You paid for it. You did the arrangements. If it goes wrong, what am I going to do? Get up tight? What's that going to do? If we don't make it to the airport on time, I'm sure you're going to be working out some other solution here. If this doesn't happen, I'm sure you'll figure out something yourself. So instead of pressuring everyone, I just sat back and and relaxed and enjoyed myself. Had a wonderful time. Now, I may be more relaxed than some people on those things at times. Because I've been in the position where you're in charge and you're making all the decisions and things don't go right and you're trying to... And you know, some of the things that makes it most complicated is when people keep asking you, what are you going to do about this and that? It's like, stop asking me and I might get it figured out. (laughs) But with God, he's got a plan for your life and for mine. And if you want peace and contentment, you want just a peace that passes understanding in this life, then sit back 
Take your hands off the wheel and let the Lord work. And I'm not saying be passive and be a bum. That's not what I'm saying. But take your hands off where you feel like you have to be in control. And when you do that, you'll experience a fullness of presence in this life. You'll be able to enjoy more of this life because you're walking with the Lord, not trying to control everything. Who is this crown of life for? Well, it's for the man who loves the Lord. It's in this verse by the man that endures temptation because he loves the Lord. It's interesting, the word here for um, temptation, I'm sorry, for the word for crown here, is the Greek word Stephanos. And you can probably figure out someone's name in Scripture who has that Greek word as a name. It was the martyr Stephen. Stephen has the name Stephanos, and that mean, literally means crown. And that's kind of one of the reasons that's also connected to the martyr's crown. But Stephen was stoned to death for his faith. He was willing to lay his life down. He endured his trial and his testing, and he died. But there's other characters in Scripture who endured tests. Think of Joseph in the book of Genesis. What a bunch of ornery brothers to sell their brother into slavery. I mean, it's better than the first thought. Let's kill him. They sell their brother to slavery. I don't know about you, but that right there would make me bitter. He's taken to a foreign people in a foreign land. He's... I, I don't know if I want to say he was cuffed, but he was he was now a slave. He's sold on an auction block and ends up in Potiphar's house, who's a man of high rank, but he's a slave. He does pretty good in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar sees prospect in him, and everything God, that Joseph does, God blesses. But he's still a slave. And then when Potiphar's wife frames him and says, hey, there was an, he tried to have an affair with me, he's now thrown in prison. Is it his fault he got sold to Egypt? Is it his fault he got thrown in prison? He's in prison for a couple years and tell, interprets dreams for a couple guys and they forget about him until the Pharaoh has a, a dream. And the end of Joseph's story is Joseph sitting at the right hand of the Pharaoh in Egypt, Joseph's second command in Egypt. But his life was a mess. Sold by your brothers, thrown in prison, being a slave, being forgotten about to rot in a jail cell. But Joseph, we don't sense any bitterness in his life. As we read the story of Joseph, there's a few points early on I might question the wisdom of a 17-year-old boy. But by the end... He's testing his brothers to see if their hearts have changed, but he shows absolutely no remorse and bitterness to his brothers. In fact, when Jacob dies, his brothers come to him and say, okay, now that dad's dead, we want to make clear, we're yours. We're we're not going to, you know. And Joseph's like, I'm not bitter at you. I wasn't holding my bitterness to get back at you after dad died. Joseph had that perspective of even though life stunk, God was in control. And when he was in the middle of being tempted in Potiphar's house, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against not myself or do this and that or hurt my self-esteem? How can I sin against God? That's what he was concerned about. The last thing here to notice is the reason for this man's hope. It's which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he will, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. God has promised a crown of life to those who love him. The Christian's only hope truly is the promises of God. And our love for the Lord enables us to believe and obey and rest on what God has promised. John said in 1 John 4, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. 
He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Truly, if you and I love the Lord as we ought to, we're going to be willing to endure trials and testings and, and things that oppose our faith because we love the Lord and it produces a faith in Him. In a marriage context, when you don't, when you don't have faith in the other person, it's indicating a lack of love. Again, James 1 8, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Again, here we have we how do you and I respond to pressure? If we truly love the Lord, we're gonna respond with faith. We're gonna respond knowing that God's gonna work these things out for good. But we can also be tempted to doubt. Again, this is not simply we're going to get some sort of a, a life eternally that is, you know, we're going to survive for eternity, but rather this is God giving us a crown of life. The best of life is what we will have for eternity because we're willing to put our chips in with God. We're willing to throw our weight in on His side and be with Him. The image kind of used here, we go through testings, that is to produce a steadfastness with us, within us, a completeness. We're then approved by God and we receive a crown of life. I don't know about you, but I'd like to receive that crown. Now the martyr's crown, I don't believe, is one that if you just run out in front of a semi and say, I want to be martyred for Christ, that's not how you get it. And I, I believe, and this may not be as much grounded in Scripture as my own thinking, but I think those who even don't necessarily die as martyrs, but they live with their life completely given to Christ, I think they can get the crown too. I don't, I can't prove that. But is your life and mine wholesale given to the Lord for Him to do with what He wants? So we apply and just kind of bring this, wrap this up this morning here. How do you view trials? It's almost sounding repetitive here in the book of James. It's, it's a big theme of this opening section. Do you view them as opportunities to say, Hallelujah, I get to see what God is going to do? Or do you view them and respond to them in a way inwardly that turns that trial into a temptation to sin and to doubt God? How do you endure them? Do you hold on to the promises of God? you got to know the promises before you can hold them. I want to take a minute here to talk about faith. Faith has been illustrated a lot of ways, and I'd like to illustrate it here with a bridge. The question of your faith in mine is a threefold question. One, how many supports does your faith need? Some have maybe called it a token for good. Um, God says, I'm going to do this. How many little things along the way do you need to see to help confirm to you that God's doing that? How much support does your faith need? Does it need two, three, four? Does God continually have to keep showing you little things that, hey, I'm, I'm working on this? Also then, how long can your faith endure? So how long can it endure on how little support? Sometimes in Scripture, there's a long time that has to happen before God fulfills His promise. Abraham waited 25 years from the time he was promised a son to the time he got one. I don't know about you, but 25 years is a long time to wait. The Jews had promised a Messiah, and yet they waited and waited and waited, and waited. And generations later, the promise came true. And today we're still waiting for Christ to return in His second coming and come again. And also with our faith is how many obstacles can it support or bear? We, our faith may be supported and we may be able to, to last longer in our faith because, because we've seen a, a measure of God working. But then we see two or three things that happen that seem to go against what we're trusting God for. And the more weight put on our faith, how much can our faith endure? 
Abraham went 25 years. How much support did he need for his faith? God kept coming to him saying, yep, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna give you a son. And yet, each year was like another weight of, yeah, it's not gonna happen this year. I ain't any, I ain't any more physically ready than I was last year. And your faith and my faith should be able to endure the long haul, endure weight and obstacles put on it, and endure not needing God to constantly prop us up with a little token of good. Now, I'm not against God giving you a token for good, and God knows how strong your faith can be. But we're always going to have pressures of life. James is calling us for us to endure temptations, endure trials, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. How much can you and I handle before we break? Now, in a bridge, your faith is in a bunch of metal. If you're crossing it, that's all it is, is a bunch of metal. But you and I, the object of our faith is not a metal chair, like what you're sitting on. It's a God who created the universe. A God who put the planets in their place. A God who spoke and all things came to be. It's kind of sad how we'll trust a designer we've never met, an engineer, a carpenter, and all sorts of things to sit in a chair that we've never verified. In fact, how many of you stopped to check to make sure your chair had four legs before you sat down? You just sat. And yet when it comes to what we call big decisions in life, we'll trust anybody but the Lord. We'll run to any problem book or whatever. We'll try to get out from under the temptation or temptations we want to get out of because they're to do sin. But a trial that comes our way, we try to get out from them and say, okay, we gotta, I gotta work. Let the Lord do his work. And at the end of the day, hallelujah, see what God can do. Would that be the resounding note of your life? Is that you can say, hallelujah, see what God can do. And as he did it, and I trusted him, he gave me a crown of life. Let's close in a word of prayer here this morning. Lord, we ask that this morning as we've looked here at the book of James and the promise here of a crown of life, Lord, we ask that you would build our faith Would we see you for who you are? Would we be willing to trust you and put all of our weight on you and depend on you through every circumstance? Lord, there's times we don't know what the future holds. We don't understand what's going on. We we sometimes just are completely befuddled by life. Lord, I ask that you would enable us to constantly cast all our cares and our burdens on you. And at the end of the day, would the resounding note of our life be hallelujah, see what God can do. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.